there's a degree of difficulty in dealing with me. There's some lyrics from a great song by City and Colour called Little Hell. And upon reflection, that's what it must be like to deal with me. I had a great phone call with a friend last night as I finished up another weekend of personal development with Morgan Nelson down at the Dream Out Loud Method. It was some of the most powerful, potent, transformational work that I've done. And I've done a lot of personal and professional development in my life. I don't have words because the English language is so limited to point towards what we actually experienced. The leadership, the space, the healing, the authenticity that was held by Morgan and his team was unparalleled. It's something that I aim towards now. The way that he showed up, the way that he held space, his processes, his linguistics, his reframes, everything that he did was world-class. Absolutely unbelievable. So getting back to those opening lyrics, there's a degree in difficulty in dealing with me. I've had a lot of reflection this weekend. And last night I had a great phone call with one of my best friends of the last damn near 20 years. And I asked him for some feedback because I'm feeling a lot of stuff going on. I'm not who I used to be, but I'm not quite who I want to be either. I'm not quite who I want to be, or I'm not doing the things that I want to be doing because I've recognized that I've been playing small for so long. And a lot of it comes down to being undiagnosed ADHD, ASD. That's where the shirt comes from. I have both of those disabilities. I got disability and dadability. They're just labels. However, those labels, those words, they point to a truth. They point to dramatic inconsistency inside of me, shiny object syndrome, and a whole host of other things. And that's what we're gonna be getting into in this episode of the Rise Movement Podcast. It's going to be all about identity because I only really just feel like I've found who I am and it's confronting. I've done all the things but I've never been me. So let's dive into this episode today. Welcome to the Rise Movement Podcast, a place where legends just like you learn how to raise your standards every day. So welcome back to another episode of the Rise Movement Podcast. I'm Dave. And like I said, this is all about identity and this is about shiny object syndrome more than anything else. So I just wrote down all of the different variations of identity and the themes, the emotions that I was running from because I didn't know what I wanted, but I knew what I didn't want. I was an expert on focusing on all the things that I didn't want. I would try something new and then I would notice all of the things that weren't in alignment and I would break that thing. I would destroy it. I'd sabotage it. I'd implode it over and over and over because I'm like, okay, cool. I don't resonate with this anymore. It doesn't, it doesn't feel good to me. It makes me feel shit. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to nuke it and get rid of it. So starting when I was a mid teenager, I'm going to go through these quickly. Mid teenager, skateboarding, jackass, sex, porn, drinking. I was the rebel. I was the black sheep. I was very much look at me, give me attention because so much anger, so much shame, so much fear, pride, and I was desperate. I was so desperate for attention. Just please see me, love me, give me attention, give me validation because I, deep down, I hate who I am. I don't know that I hate who I am. I can't articulate it. I can't be alone with my thoughts. Uh, I didn't even know that I was having negative thoughts and negative emotions, but anxiety ran really, really high for majority of my teenage life. 17, 18, 19, I adopted the identity of a metalhead, a Macca's manager, and I was always the life of the party. I was always doing the things for love, attention, validation, approval by making people laugh, by doing dumb shit, by you know excessive amounts of drinking, excessive amounts of sex. Like I would numb myself to the point where here's an interesting story. I was off doing my Macca's uh, first uh, shift supervisor, back then it was called SSC. I was doing this course in Brisbane and the first night that we get up there, we're doing our course and all the rest of it and I'm big noting myself, I'm saying, yeah, I'm the fucking best. There was this other guy up there, really, uh, really confident, really good looking bloke and I was so desperate to get his attention and approval because I wanted to be him. 
he was charismatic, he was handsome, he was fit, or like all the things that I wasn't. Like I was fit-ish, like I was training-ish, but I wasn't him. He was just, you know, beautiful, beautiful, handsome man. And I was like, fuck, I wanna be him, so I'm gonna try and impress him. And if anything, it just made me look like a fuckwit. So we're there, we're doing things, and I had this idea, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna push an hour of power. So I don't know if you guys have ever done an hour of power when it comes to drinking, is basically you drink to get blind drunk as fast and as many drinks as you can in an hour and see if you can stay standing, see if you can stay coherent. So I can't remember what I drank, I'm pretty sure it was like a bottle of Jägermeister or something like that, and we were swimming, and um, I almost drowned a few times because I was that belligerent. Then we get organized, get ready to go out to the city. We go to the city, there's this, uh, there's this pub in Brisbane city called the Pig and Whistle. It's on the outside of the city, not the one that's inside. And I was sitting down, I was starving, but I had no money because I spent it all on alcohol. So I was eating sugar to get some food because no one was gonna pay me anything, no one was gonna give me any food. And we were so far away from a Macca's that I couldn't go get you know, a half price discount or whatever it was. That was a really, really, really hard memory to be able to sit with. I was so desperate for attention, I would do anything. Like, I would do fucking anything. It was horrible. Then, moving on, still the life of the party, you know, still heavily drinking, uh, smoking cigarettes, all the rest of the things. From 19 to 20, my best friend dies, and I get this massive, massive awareness, this massive, almost like, like big slap upside the head. So he died three weeks before his 21st birthday. He was riding on his Yamaha R1. His girlfriend was sitting on the back of the bike. She was late to work, so he was uh, racing her to work. And he was coming up this hill, riding in the bike lane, doing about 100, 110 in a 60 zone. And a car turned left into the street that they were going to, not thinking to shoulder check because there might be a fucking motorbike coming up. And he T-boned him and died on the scene. That moment snapped me awake. I was like, life is way too short. I'm in a relationship I don't wanna be in. The only reason that I'm in this relationship is because her family love and approve of me. I didn't even really like her that much. It was what her family was giving me. It was the big thing that I was missing from my family. She had this big, beautiful family. You know, um, her siblings were older. She was the youngest and like, I was like, that's the family that I want. I want a connected family. I wanna catch up with everyone weekly. I wanna do all these things because it was what I was missing. He dies so much grief, so much sadness, disappointment. And then the moment that I had this snap to awakening, I broke up with her and I was just like, I'm done, I can't do this anymore. I'm, I'm done with you, um, I'm done with everything. And like, she was a lovely girl, lovely, lovely girl. Didn't deserve what I put her through. And so then from there, started training hard. I was like, all right, Michael died before he was 21, before he could, you know, get married, have kids, you know, experience a great life, experience, all the good things that were to offer, I'm gonna send it. I'm gonna do all the things that I've left undone. So I did a bodybuilding competition. You know, I, I moved hell and high water. I was moving and shaking. I was doing really, really well that year. This is 2010. That's where I became store manager, the youngest store manager in Queensland. Um, I was running a $2.2 million business. The one thing that I got told to go fix was to fix profitability, fix all the systems. So I did exactly that. That like a lot of the records that stood when I was there in the 12 months that I was store manager, they stood for a long time, a long, long time. And that was a huge thing about my ego. It's like, you give me a job to do, this is also undiagnosed autism, you give me a job to do in a business that is so perfect, values level four, for those that don't understand, go look at Veronica Satir's work and Don Beck, Claire Graves, Spiral Dynamics, values level four, stage level blue, you, and being autistic, you give me a business that is perfect. You give me a business that has policies, procedures, it has systems, everything is executed so well down to the T, down to the fucking 0.00 cent. Like it's, it's perfect. So I'm going to do everything by the book. I'm going to get the profit. I'm going to, you know, bring it back to basics. And that's what I did. I had phenomenal results. Like head office were like blown away with me from what I was doing, which boosted my ego even more. And I just became super arrogant. I did a bodybuilding competition whilst I was store manager at Macca's, which I don't recommend anyone doing because the food and like, obviously I didn't win because I was still eating Macca's food and my mind just hadn't shifted into what real food was and all that sort of thing just yet. I was like, yeah, yeah like, you know, I can eat, I can eat McChicken patties. I can eat the, you know, the, the seared chicken patties and stuff like that and get lean and win. Uh, delusional, delusional started uh, stepping in very, very heavily. 
then from 20 to 24, I thought I was living by purpose. I was like, I always wanted to become a personal trainer from about year 11 onwards. Um, but I got kicked out of every damn theory lesson. I had this poor teacher of mine at Mary Mac High, her name was Mrs. Palmer. I had her three times a day for three days a week. And by the time that we'd get to day two where you know we're doing theory from 8 a.m. Um, for PE, and then we have another class, which I think was English. And then after the break, we had the other PT and then maths before lunch. Like she saw me three out of the four, um, the four classes for that morning. She fucking hated me. Every time that I pissed her off, I'd walk into the room, David, get out. I go, miss, I haven't done anything. She goes, David, get out. I don't care, get out. So I'd leave. And then, or I'd walk in the room and she'd say, David, get out. And I'd say, I haven't done anything yet. And she goes, yeah, yet, get out. She hated me so much. I feel sorry for her. I was such a dick. Again, undiagnosed autistic ADHD. You don't know what you don't know when you're going through it. You just think, oh, well, I'm a fuck up. I'm a piece of shit, you know? I'm not good enough to be in here. So then started my PT business, things were going good, you know, uh, but I was going through another breakup because I was just, I was a cunt. I was an absolute cunt. My ex, I'm not gonna say her name, uh, either of the names, but like I was an absolute asshole to them. Again, dopamine seeking, risk seeking behavior, gambling, sex, porn, like all, you know, cheating, all the things, all the things. I was a piece of shit, but I had this massive like ego complex, narcissism, arrogance like I, I thought I was God's gift to women like I'd walk around with my shirt off and you know like I remember this one thing I probably already said this on the podcast before but we were at um, Sin City it was ladies night on Thursday night I was two weeks out from bodybuilding show and uh, the boys were going out for someone's birthday one of the boys goes because there were strippers around that were topless waiters um, one of the boys goes Dave take your shirt off you got a better body than half of these guys go show them how it's done and I was like Fuck yeah, fuck yeah, that sounds good. I can't remember if I actually did it, but then again, I can't actually remember if this is a figment in my imagination and you know the way that the mind works, deletes, distorts and generalizes, but I don't even know if that's real. I don't even know if that's true. That could be just a figment of my imagination to boost my ego and boost my self-importance, my self-esteem, because underlying things, anger, shame, fear, pride, desperation, grief, sadness, you know, loads of disappointment. I was a narcissist, arrogant, you know, just so much ego, so much ego, so much infatuation and fantasy and delusion. And like, I was a fuckhead. God, I was a fuckhead. Um, the thing that I lived by, I'd say fig jam a lot. Fig jam, for those that don't understand for all the US and uh, UK viewers that we got on the channel now. Fuck, I'm good, just ask me. I lived by that. That was, that was my mindset. Fuck, I'm good, just ask me. Delusion. From 24 to 26, I became a father and I became a doormat. I very much believed in the, the adage, the, me the metaphor or whatever it is, happy wife, happy life. So the abuse that I was facing, I've said this in you know the second episode of the podcast. If you haven't heard my story, jump back onto that one. I'm not gonna go into details here, but it wasn't just, it wasn't just her being abusive. I was abusive. I gaslit the shit out of her. I manipulated her. I cheated on her. Like, I was a fucking piece of shit. Absolute piece of shit. I was so unhealed. And remember the saying, hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. And I was deeply hurt. So yes, she was hurting me and abusing me and stuff like that. But at the same time, so was I. Like, I remember the night that I broke up with her and I moved all my shit into the separate room. I, I couldn't even count how many dick pics I sent out that night thinking that that's a good idea to be able to, you know, I haven't even moved out of the family home yet, but I'm gonna try and fuck everything because I feel so shit about myself. And I did, like, I, the amount of girls that I chased after that, ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And I'm not saying this to be able to condemn myself or to beat myself up or anything like that. This is acceptance. It's to say, this is what it looks like to be unhealed, un processed, undiagnosed ADHD, unmedicated ADHD with such low levels of dopamine that everything you do is risk seeking behavior. Everything you do is to try and get dopamine. Like I'm surprised that I didn't end up with more substance abuses, like uh, substance abuse addictions or problems or anything like that. I stopped drinking heavily when I was about 20. Still had the occasional piss up. The last time I got drunk, I had six beers here maybe 18 months ago. The time before that was my best mate's 35th, uh, 35th his, my best mate's 30th birthday in 2019. The last time that I got drunk before that was his wedding, 2017. The last time I got drunk before that was his Bucks weekend, 2017. Like, I'm so surprised that knowing what I know about 
ADHD, knowing what I know about dopamine and all these sorts of things, I'm so surprised that I didn't self-medicate with substances. It would have been so easy. It's easy. Like, God, the amount of drug dealers that I knew, the amount of bikies that I knew, the, just like it was there. It was always there. And I'd have people go, hey, do you, you know, you do want a bag? You know, you've helped me out and all the rest of it. Do you want a bag? No, I'm not interested in that. God, I'm so lucky that I didn't. So lucky. You know, everything's perfectly polarized. Like there's good and bad in everything. It's heavy, heavy stuff. If only, if only we knew, if only we knew. But it is what it is. You just got to move forward with, with, what you pro- with what's around you. So then from 26 to 32, that's where I started doing all my healing and changing work, you know, counseling, therapy. Um, I went and, you know, studied a bunch of different courses. That's like from 20, end of 2016 to 2019, that's probably where I spent the most amount of my money in personal and professional development. Those two and a half, three years, I probably spent about 35, 40 grand in those time to be able to develop myself and to be able to learn all the tools and stuff like that. Um, like it was great. I did a load of change work and I felt a lot better and healed a hell of a lot and integrated a hell of a lot. But again, it was just the wrong lens to be looking through. Instead, I could have just gone straight to psychiatry, straight to psychology and said, Hey, I've got this, this, and this, these are my behaviors. Like, what is it? What am I looking for? Because I'm looking for a lens to be able to view my life through and I can't find it. And it would have been really simple. Oh, all of these behaviors point to ADHD and being autistic. How do you do this, 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 and this? How do you process this? What's your thing with money like? What's your thing with blah, blah, blah? And like, it would have been obvious. We didn't know what we didn't know. We just have to deal with it. The, the arrogance that came through this, I developed such a protective shell of an ego. Everything was projection. Everything was, look how good I am because of what I know. What I know, not what I'm embodied, not what I'm living through leadership, not what I'm showing up as. There was so much cognitive dissonance around. I was holding so many conflicting beliefs. I know all these things, but I don't do all these things. And they were just like giant shadows. I wasn't aware of what was going on. I was like, why is there such a disconnect in my message? Why aren't, you know, why aren't I getting all these clients? Entitlement was huge at that time. 2018, 2019, I was so entitled. I was like, I know all this shit. I'm the fucking man. Why aren't you guys paying me thousands of dollars to come work with me? I knew it. I didn't fucking embody it. I wasn't leading through embodiment. Crazy, absolutely crazy. 33 to 35, I'm not 35 yet, 35 in September. The big thing was I said, fuck this, I'm done running. I'm done running. I'm constantly changing from this to that, to this, to that. Like I would go from being a PT and a bodybuilder to powerlifter to like so many different identities. Like I've done so many different sports. I've done so many different training philosophies and all these sorts of things. And I wear it for a while and I'm like, oh, I'll see how this works. See if I like it. I go, no, nah, I don't like this, this, and this. You know, it's not what I want. It's what I don't want. Okay, cool. Next. And I'll go to the next thing. Whereas now I'm not running anymore. I remember late 22, 2022, I had a woman I was sitting down with. She was an NDIS support worker and uh, ADHD, ASD herself. And we're getting on like a house on fire. And she goes, so when did you get diagnosed? I was like, the fuck are you talking about? I'm not diagnosed with anything. And she goes, oh, I'm really sorry. You might want to look at that. And I felt so seen, the fir- like the first time I've ever felt so seen in my life. She looks straight through me and she goes, okay. Okay, you might want to look into that. And then, you know, the call to adventure of the hero's journey, I refuse the call. It's one of the major parts of the hero's journey is to ignore and refuse the call. I sat on it for ages. I armed and armed. I started doing the things so I could get the knowledge. Like I started listening to podcasts and reading books and, you know, becoming well-versed in it because I started suspecting that my youngest daughter was ADHD from the time that she was probably about four years old. Um, more autistic than ADHD, but like I started, started figuring some things out. I was like, Okay, I'm gonna look into it for her. And the more I looked into it, the more that I learned, the more that it was a mirror reflecting upon myself. I'm like, fuck, fuck, it's me. It's me and it always has been. Everything that I've ever done, risk-seeking behavior, dopamine-seeking behavior, gambling, poor finances, you know, chopping and changing, shiny object syndrome, like sex, gambling, like all of the things. It's to self-soothe because I don't have the right amount of dopamine. Don't have the right amount of dopamine. 
and now being medicated on Intunive. So I'm still on two milligrams of Intunive every day. And that takes the edge off my emotions. That takes the edge off the rejection sensitivity dysphoria. It takes the edge off, takes the edge off life a lot. I notice that I'm not as reactive. I'm still reactive. I'm working on it every single day to be my best at all times and make sure I respond, not react. My nervous system's so pent up with reactivity, with anxiety. It's a lot to undo. I have to be really, really conscious. Otherwise I'll snap. Otherwise I'll get you know, really, really snippy with the kids or Rach or you know, clients or anyone. And they'll go, who's this dickhead? Why is he so snappy? Why is he so arrogant? Why is he so angry? It's a default. It's what my nervous system was for so long. And this year, the biggest thing that I'm doing this year is learning how to unwind my nervous system and regulate. Because if you don't have it when you're stressed, you're not gonna have it, no, how does the saying go? If you don't have it when you're calm, you're not gonna have it when you're stressed. So you have to teach yourself what it is now because it's that same old special forces saying, you don't rise to the occasion, you fall back to your level of training. So if I deliberately do the things while I'm calm and I embody them, become them, then when I'm stressed out, it'll be a lot easier. I'll be able to catch myself in the moment and remember that I've got all the resources from all of my training, you know, from NLP, hypnosis, from timeline therapy, from breath work, from fucking, from everything that I've done, everything that I've done. And I can go, okay, cool, like I'm stressed out, I'm dysregulated, I'm noticing things in the environment are pissing me off. Okay, come back into the center. What am I actually feeling? What am I processing? What do I need to do? What is it, how that I need to show up? How do I need to respond? And then we'll go from there. So over the last, over the last 12 months, there's been a lot of acceptance. There's been a lot of tears shed. There's been a lot of apologies. Last night, that feedback call that I had with my best friend, Tim, asking him to tell it to me straight and say, hey, you know, I need some help. I've got some stuff that is going on and I really want to rekindle our friendship with all the brothers because Tim and I have, you know, we've spoken through a lot. Him and I didn't see eye to eye for a long time and it was just my, my giant ego versus his giant ego and we just butted heads and we parted ways for a long time. And then he reached out an olive branch and he said, hey man, I want to work on things. I want to, you know, reconnect. I said, yeah, this is a great idea. And then we just, from that moment on, we just aired everything out and it was like water under the bridge. It was, it doesn't matter anymore, but we're going to hold each other to a high standard. We're going to hold each other to account and we're going to call each other out and call each other forward into greatness and say, this isn't it. This isn't on. You're better than that. You can do better than that. Be better than that. I really appreciate him for the feedback he gave me because it allowed me to craft this message to be able to send to my brothers and say, Hey, like it must've been a really fucking hard time being my friend with the inconsistency that I've shown up with over the last 20 odd years, it must be really hard to be friends with me. And I just wanna say, I'm sorry. Like I said at the start of the podcast, there's a degree in difficulty in dealing with me. I'm a really challenging person to be with. I can't even imagine what it's like to be my fiance, <laughs> to be Rachel, to see someone who she loves so much, be so inconsistent, be so volatile, so much negative emotion, so much self-sabotage, you know, the fucking, the gambling and you know, just everything else. The inauthenticity, the, like, I remember, this is a bit personal, but I remember it was around 2016 when Rachel and I, we only just got together in 2015. And I was thinking, oh, I'm a little bit bored with our love life. I'm a little bit bored. Like things aren't, you know, things aren't fiery for me anymore. And um, I was acting like a cunt. I was acting like a, you know, a little child. I was never taught to talk through these things. You know, I was just taught like, it is what it is, suck it up. But you know, shadow behavior always comes out. Ego comes out. And so she sits me down and goes, what the fuck is wrong with you? I was like, I don't want to say it. Like, you know, eventually it came out and she goes, was that so hard? All you had to do was tell me. All you had to do was tell me. You can talk to me. I'm meant to be your partner. I'm meant to be the person that you love. You can talk to me. I was like, oh shit. I didn't realize that I couldn't say, that I could speak up. I didn't realize that it was as simple as me saying, hey, I'm noticing this, I feel this, can we do something about it? And all of a sudden, massive transformation, instantly. Rachel's like, yeah, we can fucking fix this. And I was like, oh shit, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal at all. We can talk through it. And then so opening up that space of accountability and stuff for her to help manage me because I was so volatile, so damaged, so broken, so fragile, so insecure. 
I couldn't talk about shit. Whereas now, like, I, I show up and I talk authentically as, as, as authentically as I can. You know, I wear my emotions on my sleeve. And over this last weekend, I cried so damn much. I let go of so much this weekend. I'm not gonna say all the processes because it was such a weekend. Honestly, if you're into personal development and growth and changing and healing once and for all and embodying it, the Dream Out Loud method is really, really special. You need to go do it. Saturday night, we did this ritual where we had to forgive a person in our life for all of the expectations and resentments and you know everything else, that, that, you know, not leaving things left unsaid. And my piece was to my dad but it was also to me. It was the previous version of me. Yesterday, I lodged my name change for my birth certificate to become David Sarkany, my new identity. And what this means to me is I'm gonna keep it secret and private, but I'm stepping into a new version of me that is by design deliberately. David Alexander Kerastesi is dead and gone. Like, he's done, he's not me. <laughs> to be honest, he never was me. He was divided. He was looking for the things he didn't want. He didn't know how to show up. He didn't know. He just didn't know. Whereas me now, completely different. And I want it to be by design. I want it to be intentional. I want to show up as the most authentic version of me, as the greatest version of me. This last weekend, like saying goodbye and I'm sorry and I forgive you to my father, the person who I held so much resentment around, so much hate, like so much so that I would fantasize about killing him. I'd fantasize about how I would do it. Whereas now, like there's no emotional charge to it anymore. Like what he did to me growing up, what he did to our family, what he did to my sister and you know, how, hurt he, how much he hurt everyone, how much he manipulated people. He was just a lost soul. He was just a lost soul. And whilst I'm not gonna forgive the things that he did to other people, I can forgive what he did to me. It's up to the other people to forgive him for what he did and who he was. He's just a damaged human. Very damaged, very fragile, very big ego. Probably undiagnosed autistic as well. I forgave him. But in forgiving myself, that's where I felt the freedom. I felt like I just you know, threw this gigantic backpack off my shoulders and I was like, okay, I'm cool. I'm cool, I'm safe, I'm safe. And because I make my own safety and because I provide for myself, I can show up as authentically as I can, as I want to be. So now stepping into my new identity, my new version of me, David Sarkany. Sarkany is a Hungarian word that means dragon. It's actually pronounced Sarkany. And it means dragon, it's like their old folklore dragon. And I feel like it's very fitting. I can't outrun my, my Hungarian heritage. I can't outrun my genetics, I can't outrun my bloodline. But what I can do is I can create new, I can create from deliberate place, intentional place. And then as we were getting ready to let go of the forgiveness, of the resentment, all the things, Morgan goes, I want you to set yourself free or at least that's what I heard in my head, the distortion perhaps. <laughs> and he goes, all of you have something inside of you that you're ashamed, embarrassed, guilty about, resenting, something like that. Now's your chance to be able to write it down and let it go once and forever. Let it out in the open and let it go. The moment he said that, I knew exactly what mine was. I knew exactly what it was. It came to me front and center of my mind. I was like, holy fuck, this is it. This is the thing that has been holding me back and fucking up my life for so long. This thing that I've kept in the shadow that's been so far outside of my awareness. The thing that made me feel like I'm a fraud, that I'm a failure, that I'm not good enough, that you know, I don't deserve to have nice things, that I don't deserve to have success and love and you know, all these things that I'm so desperately trying to create by focusing on the things that I don't want. All of a sudden it was there front and center. I wrote it down quickly and it was time to share, I jumped up, I fucking ran to the center, I ran to be able to spit this shit out and let this disgusting like shame and embarrassment go once and for all. And the rules of this workshop, as most workshops are, is rule one, play it 100%. Don't settle, 
remember my business, the Rise Movement, R-Y-S-E, raise your standards everywhere. So I raised my standards to 100%. I showed up as the best that I could, the most authentic, the most vulnerable, the most transparent that I could. And I jumped, I ran at the opportunity. I was like, this is it, once and for all, done. And I said, when I was a boy, I was a very interested, sexual little being. I was about eight years old, eight or nine years old. And my friends and I had three close neighbors that were like, they were my best friends. And we used to do a bunch of gay shit. We we're all experimenting as most little boys and girls do. I removed all the shame around that. So an instance of what happened, I won't go into the details, but we're under a big blanket, my mate and I. We we're doing some stuff. And his dad comes in the room, goes, the fuck are you little cunts doing? Hoiked up the blanket and started screaming, started berating us. So much shame, so much embarrassment, so much guilt. I just wanted to hide. I wanted to die. I didn't know what we were doing was wrong. We were just playing. We we're having fun. We we're experimenting. No one ever told me that you can't do that. And then all of a sudden, all of this fucking imprint just got locked into my nervous system, into my unconscious. And that held me back for so many years. Like I'm 35 in September. And this held me back in every way. It was the thing that taught me that I'm not safe. That being a sexual being is to be behind closed doors, to be hidden, to be done in secret. Hence the way that I lied, cheated, manipulated, the way that I got whatever I wanted out of girls. So much so that when I was about 17, 18, I think I've said this on the podcast, I'm not sure. There was a friend in our friendship group and she said, and I she didn't say it while I was around, but it got round to me. And she said, we wouldn't have these problems in our group if David keep his dick in his pants. I was like, the fuck? Like people know about this? Yeah, obviously people know about this. They fucking talk. You're a piece of shit. Of course people are gonna talk about you being a piece of shit, about manipulating people, about you know just trying to get whatever you want out of women and then leaving them on like leaving them to pick up the pieces. They're not play toys, but that's how I treated everything because the shame that I felt, the embarrassment that I felt, the amount of women that I've pursued become a chameleon, become a snake, to be able to get whatever I want out of them and then just drop them like a piece of shit and just go, cool, I got what I wanted out of you, I'm done. That was what my teenage years all the way up until I was about 25, 26, just before I got together with Rach. And even then with Rach, there was girls that I'd message, there was girls that would send me nudes and all the rest of it. And it wasn't until you know a couple of years into it where Rach confronted me and she says, no, if you wanna do that, do it, but you won't have me. And I was like, fuck, fuck, what am I doing? And then from there, that's where I went all in on the relationship. But it was only after she came down on me like a ton of bricks and said, no, if you're gonna do that, do it, but be single. You're not gonna do it with me. Fuck. So I said the piece that the original shame came from, the piece before the original shame was embodied in my body. That sounds funny. I said, I find men and women attractive. I don't necessarily want to be or to do or to hook up or to sleep with a man, but there's nothing wrong in finding people attractive. It doesn't matter sex, it doesn't matter culture, it doesn't matter skin color, sexy, sexy, and that's okay. But because of the experience that I had when I was a little boy, not knowing anything different, oh no, we can't say that, that's gay. You remember what the F word was when we were in the late 90s and 2000s before it became the word that you can't say anymore? Yeah, I was a massive homophobe, massive homophobe. I'd hang so much shit on people for being gay. But I was exactly that too. And often perception is projection. The thing that you project into the world is a perception, it's a mirror of you. Makes so much sense, doesn't it? So the thing that you project onto people, your insecurities, 
comes from a place of shame, guilt, embarrassment, resentment, bitterness, betrayal, all the negative emotions that we don't want to sit through because they feel gross. I've been such an angry guy all of my life because I was so embarrassed, because I was so ashamed. Why do you think I was a bodybuilder? Because men's bodies were good to look at. That's why I joke so, <laughs> that's why I joke so openly about you know, Henry Cavill being the pinnacle of a man that you know, you'd bend over and take it if he said yes. <laughs> like That's a joke. There's elements of truth inside of that for a lot of people. Same thing with Ryan Reynolds, same thing for you know, a lot of people. The thing that you joke about, and you go, oh no, it's just a joke. Well, there's an element of truth in every joke. So I hope me taking off my mask, showing up authentically and bringing my peace, my integration front and center, I hope it gives you the permission to do the same. Because after we wrapped up for that night and we were saying goodbye to everyone, giving everyone big hugs, the amount of thank yous that I got for showing up the way that I did because I gave myself permission to play at 100%. I had guys say, I wouldn't have said my piece if it wasn't for you. I wouldn't have said my piece if you didn't show the leadership and, and show up authentically the way that you did. I was gonna say something different, but because you led, I was like, fuck, I have to say it, I have to let it go. That's a really cool piece. Because I gave myself permission, other people gave themselves permission. And that's a fucking cool thing. And that's what we're all here for. That's what the Rise Movement's all about, to raise your standards everywhere. I will continue, and this is a fucking vow and a promise. I continue to continue. <laughs> I continue to continue. I vow to always keep raising my standards everywhere. And I hope you keep raising your standards everywhere. Be authentic. Be you. Be the best version of you possible. Heal all of your shit once and for all so that you're not self-sabotaging, so you're not playing the victim, so that you know that you can do, be, have and experience anything that you want to choose and take massive action towards, towards your fuck yes life. You can do it. I know you can do it because I've done it and I am doing it and I am being it. You got this. You got this. So much love. Take care. I'll see you next week. Thank you for being with me today. Thank you for subscribing and leaving a review. It really helps us out. Until next time, take care and much love.